you've met three of our panelists in the last session. And our fourth uh, panelist uh, is the famous Tyrone Hayes. I, I guess, Tyrone, you might, since you haven't been introduced, say a few words about who you are and for anyone that, that's not real familiar with your work. Okay. Uh, my name is Tyrone Hayes. I'm a professor of integrative biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, I, my interests are mostly in reproductive development and endocrinology, so the role of hormones in development, very similar actually to Lou Gillette's interests. My focus is typically on amphibians, and my role in sort of understanding the impact of pesticides has mostly been with work that I've done on atrazine, which is an endocrine disruptor that leads to upregulation of aromatase, which you heard about this morning, um, and that leads to demasculinization and feminization of exposed animals, amphibians, fish, reptiles, birds, mammals, you name it. And there are uh, quite a few studies now showing implications for impacts on human development and reproductive health as well. Do any of the other panelists have um, a brief comments of what they couldn't fit into their talk or want to want to mention up front? I had several slides that I didn't get get to. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure people want to want to hear those though. Huh? You do? <laughs> so I guess to respond to Ralph to what you said about the 18. So I agree. I mean, our agency agrees at NIOSH, and in the comments that we submitted, to, yes, to the comments that that NIOSH submitted to EPA, we said that the the uh, age should be 18 for for applicators. I was sure that was true. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. but I was just saying what the what the new describing what was in the right. new revised standard, not that. I agreed with all of it, but at least, you know, it's better than it was before, but it's still not perfect. And then the issue with the three farm worker women, I, I never interviewed the three women. I think they all spoke Spanish, so I, I don't speak Spanish, but you're right. I, uh, I also heard about the women um, reporting that they were directly sprayed, and it wasn't just the reentry interval. So you're right. It's it, more than that. But, yeah, I didn't have time to go into all the details, so we, we wrote a full report, and I think we talked about that, all those. Um, describe what the, what the women reported to us. So this is where, where I had to kind of speed up talking about the residues. So, so after this event happened, the grower took all the clothing samples from the workers and threw them away before the Ag Department had had a chance to collect any of them. But it turns out that a few of the women, when they went to the ED, the emergency department, they left some of their clothes there. And the grower forgot about those, or nobody reported it. So they were able to get some clothing from the ED, which they then um, sent for testing. And so the testing didn't occur until three days after the event. And with time, these residues disappear. So it's harder to measure things the more time between the exposure and when you do the measurement. But despite the three days, they still found um, triflumazole on two of the clothing samples from the farm workers. They found all three pesticides on the foliage, uh, foliage of the uh, cherry trees where the women were working. Um, they found two of the pesticides on the porta potty that the women were using. And on the grass in the cherry orchard, they found two of the pesticides. Um, so we have limitations with this analysis, as I mentioned. Um, so we always try to be upfront with everybody about there are limitations, one of which is they were exposed to a mixture of pesticides, so we couldn't identify the specific pesticide that was responsible for illness. Um, these could have been false positives. They could have not really been pesticide, uh, acute related, pesticide related illness. Um, the symptoms are nonspecific. Um, it could have been caused by a virus. And we didn't have diagnostic tests to, to prove that these women, you know, absorbed the pesticides and caused the illness. And then finally, the residue samples were collected three days after the exposure. So if they would have been collected earlier, we may have had even stronger evidence. And then the gap in worker notification requirements. So I mentioned workers 
who work on the same farm where the application is going to occur. They're the only ones that have to be notified. Um, and we I talked about the managers before used to communicate quite well with each other. And so this is not an unusual situation where there's a lack of notification of a neighboring farm. So we found that, uh, at least in Washington State, they reported that out of all the, the um, cases involving off-target drift of farm workers, a third of them involve workers who were on a neighboring farm. But there's a little caveat to that. We think that maybe one of the reasons why those cases are getting reported more than the cases on the actual farm is when it occurs on the actual farm, there's more of a incentive to not report cases that are occurring on your own farm. Whereas if you know the neighbor poisoned your workers, then you're more, you're, you've got more of an incentive to, to, to uh, raise awareness about that because then hopefully something be, can be done, whereas naturally I think people, when it occurs on their own farm, own farm they want to suppress that information. So that might be why that 35% is so high. Don't know for sure, though. And then there's also been um, another report from the California Department of Public Health uh, describing a lack of notification of a neighboring farm as a contrib contributing factor in a cluster that occurred in 2005. And then in the worker protection standard, there is some vague language to, uh, that, that prohibits applying agricultural pesticides, quote unquote, in a manner that results in contact with workers or other persons. But that's vague language. It's open to interpretation. And there's no language that specifically says, if you see somebody in the field, you should stop your application. And then I talked about this. So that's it. Thank you. Just, um, I know I'm supposed to be a moderator, but uh, j just just a comment on the diagnostic problems. Um, at physicians like myself that get asked about a lot of this stuff um, have some real problems. Um, that we tried to, we're, we are trying to pursue. Um, the, one of the big ones is uh, release of information about so-called inerts, uh, because many of the so-called inerts that are uh, protected information uh, are very toxic <laughs> and, and we have, uh, when we're asked about a case, we have very limited information about what else is in the formulation other than the so-called active ingredients. Um, so that anything we can do to compel release of everything that's in a formulation uh, helps us in diagnostic uh, situations. Uh, the other is there is there there have been several physicians on the EPA's uh, PPDC, which is the Pesticide Program Dialogue Committee, I think, um, that have been asking that there be a requirement that manufacturers and formulators develop diagnostic tests because what you just heard is uh, in many cases. Uh, there is no way to diagnose the actual amount of a chemical that is in a person or in their urine or in their tissues. Um, and, <clears throat> and it is the belief of myself and other physicians that are put into trying to make diagnoses that if the manufacturers are required to develop assays at the same time they're pursuing registration that would allow us to better document exposure, uh, our business would be a lot easier. Um, you know, you, 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 
many people think it's very easy to diagnose a pesticide poisoning, but there are lots of pitfalls in it, not the least of which are the inerts and the inability to document the actual amount that has been absorbed into the individual who's suffering symptoms. It's not just a comment, but it follows on what you just said. Uh, it, it ain't that easy to prove it, and the more tools that are developed and hopefully are required to be developed, the better. So uh, I think the panel is open for questions. Marty. So Dr. Calvin, uh, uh, your presentation, I have a few of them. And so one is, um, you, you had some funded states, a couple, and some unfunded states. What's the participation in unfunded states, i.e. Texas, where I was born and raised? And you also then said, that there were people from the Department of Health here that you worked with in Florida. Could you introduce me to the people from the Department of Health in Florida? <laughs> and then, um, and, and then I, I saw a spike in one of your slides of 2002, a really high spike uh, in that. Can you explain what, why the spike was so high? And then finally, um, in my compound question, is uh, <laughs> what you just articulated, I mean, is it, that like destroying evidence when when somebody is is you know you know spraying with pesticides to take clothing I mean you know and 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 get rid of it before you know a regulatory somebody has the ability to, to, to take the sample. So thank you for the questions. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one about the unfunded states. So those so all these states almost all of them. Uh, pretty much operate on a shoestring. So in most states, it's less than a full-time person that's, that's managing the program. Usually it's like a half-time or three-quarter time person. So in, in the unfunded states, it's, yeah, it's like there's not a whole lot of resources there. So typically they're a little late in getting their data to us. Um, it, they don't have as much detail. They don't have the resources to follow up on all the cases. So we don't have... I mentioned that we try to get detailed information on all the cases. We've got 150 variables. But in those unfunded states, there's a lot of unknowns for a lot of those variables. It's coded as unknown. So it'd be, yeah, if they had more resources, they could do, do more for us. But at least they're trying. They, they are getting data to us, so we're very appreciative of that. And I think all of those, not all of them, but most of those unfunded states were funded in the past by us. But the way that we award funding is it's a competitive process, so they have to write a grant application, and the grant, the, the proposals are reviewed by an external body. We're not part of that, and so it's based on the score that those proposals get, is how the states are determined to get our funding. So in Florida, is Prakash here? Yeah, I'm here. Prakash, so he's the director, and, pardon? Okay, <laughs> coordinator of the pesticide surveillance program, and then he's got a investigator, Antonio Tovar, back here, who works with the farm workers. And see the spike. So though, so the data that we have can be easily um, perturbed if we have a huge outbreak. And so I think in that one year where we had a spike, we had there was an, an event in California where 100 farm workers got poisoned. So that's what caused that one spike. Actually, there may have been a couple of events that year where just huge farm worker events. Oh, that was population and not numbers of events. Yeah, that was total, that was rates, rates for, for farm worker population. Pardon? Do you have details on that event? Not off the top of my head, but yeah, we do have those, the details on those events. But yeah, I couldn't tell you. And then the fourth one, the clothing disposal. I think, so I think the clothes were disposed of by the cherry orchard. And I, you know, I hate to think it, that it was nefarious. I'm thinking maybe the, maybe the grower was wanting to do the right thing. And, you know, look, people don't take these clothes home. You, I don't, we don't want you to poison your families. Just give them to us, we'll, we'll take care of it. Um, so I, I, I really don't know why. Why they why they disposed of the clothes? It could be the way you said, but it could be, uh, you know, good intentions. <laughs> so, um, 
How do you get your budget? How do we get our budget? Yeah. <laughs> in other words, <laughs> if it's not being done, enough states are supported, and enough states is a way to get more money into it. Well, well I've, I've heard, you're not to tell us how. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, just just historically, I think when legislature legislators are are motivated, and I think you know, listening when when led, legislators hear from their constituents. You know that there is some motivation there. I'm not telling anybody to do that, but oh, no. <laughs> that's sometimes that works. Um, but in our agency, like for example, in my in my federal agency, I work about a third of my time on on this work. So I'm, you know, as you heard in my in my bio, I'm kind of stretched pretty thin. So there's not a whole lot of even within my agency, there's not a whole lot of resources working on this. So, yeah, we, you know, we're, it's the, the, the federal budget and the uh, amount of money that the CDC and, and Congress gives to our agency. Might be something we should push for. Go ahead. I have a question for Tyron. Yes. Can you please tell us a little bit about how has your research findings and kind of antagonistic relationship that you have had with the industry has it been supported by your colleagues, not just at Berkeley, but all over the country? Hmm. Um. So, so the question is about, uh, so a little bit of background. I started out working on atrazine as uh, on a contract for the manufacturer who was Novartis at the time, and I discovered adverse effects of atrazine while under contract for the manufacturer, and then I'll talk about tonight. Over the last 15 years, the, well, let's just say the relationship has evolved um, and it, it evolved to a number of things, including personal attacks on me and attempts to try to have my work retracted and attempts to sort of um, discredit me in some very, well, scary is the best word I can think of. And most recently, you might know, after a court case, there are internal documents with pages and pages and pages listing the things that they were going to do to me and my family actually were written down. So there's hard evidence of what the, of what the company did. Um, and essentially, the short answer to your question is I find that most of my colleagues as scientists have been supportive of the work. And I think the, the th thing that makes me feel best about the work is that these guys spent millions of dollars trying to destroy the science and discredit my work that way and were unable to do so. So the work has not only um, withstood peer review like it like anybody else's work but it's with the you know that's somebody who's motivated to spend millions of dollars to try to discredit the work um, the my interactions with the university administration however that's a slightly different thing but certainly my colleagues and certainly on campus my colleagues have been very supportive Could you observe that? Could you, could you observe other scientists in other universities pretty much following your example I don't know about that. I mean, I have, you know, I, I have a lot of colleagues and friends in the scientific community, Lou Gillette and Elizabeth Gillette being two of them. So I have a lot of colleagues who have faced very similar things. Um, I think my, some of the things that they did to me might have been a little more dramatic than some of the things I've seen them do to other people. But, you know, and I think part of the problem is if you're not really involved, I mean, I used to watch Fred Fumsall, for example battling with these guys for industry and Theo Colborn would tell me stories and if you're not really a part of it you think oh come on this can't be true I mean you, you know some of the things that I experienced you're like wait this is like something out of a movie that these I mean some of the threats that they made to me and my family for example um, and I think in, in, in some ways their interactions with me it almost seemed like they would do things or say things to me that were so outrageous that if I talked to anybody about them then I would look crazy um, but but again now it's I mean, you know, I'll show some of this tonight. They actually wrote it down. They actually made lists of things that they were going to do to me and then commented on them. And even once their lawyer accidentally CC'd me on an email where he was complimenting his, one of his employees for threatening my wife and daughter. I mean, it was just, it was, it was just, just amazing. So, there, so I, I know other people who've faced it. I know other people who've been through sort of similar things. But whether broadly in the academic community, I mean, part, you know, part of the problem is that there's this sort of feeling in the academic community that you can't be an advocate and still be objective. 
And, and I probably do face that at some of the, you know, probably some of my colleagues that think, okay, once you're being an advocate, once I say things like ban atrazine and write to your legislator and they go, okay, he's there. There's probably people who think that. I mean, I absolutely don't don't feel that way, but you know, there may be people who in the back of their minds think that you're not objective if you're actually have an agenda that's beyond the science. So I, I just gotta comment on that one. It's just there are many scientists for whatever reason particularly academic scientists who for some, some reason are reluctant to get into the fray and be <laughs> advocates, which I have never understood. Uh, and, and I really applaud people like Tyrone. They're willing to get out front and be advocates with sound science as a basis. I mean, that's the important thing. Uh, as long as we can be very strong advocates as long as we don't go beyond the science, and, and we should. Yes, ma'am, you had your hand up, the lady? Yes. Yes, I just wanted to uh, comment that uh, I experienced the same situation that you have. I was actually suspended from my job wow. as a registered nurse for attending a public meeting about the fertilizer. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. that's, that's impressive. They brought a picture on the phone showing me at the meeting, hmm. and that's why I was suspended from my job. Wow. It would not allow me any representation, it would not allow it to be recorded, it would not allow anyone in that room, just me and that human resources person. Yes, ma'am. So it's, it's kind of on the microcosm, it's, it's a barrier for us. And even, again, just as a legal services attorney, I mean, our budgets are, are what they are. Engaging in any kind of pesticide litigation, it's just, I mean, I'm, ex I'm you guys alone, oh my goodness, I got run, numbers are just running through my mind. Even if I had, you know, I could have actually formulated an effective litigation strategy with what I have available to me in order for us to, as a community, and working with community groups that, you know, have collected some data, it's still, it's an insurmountable obstacle, and I don't know how, well, not insurmountable, it seems that way sometimes, and so I, I think that getting this information out and working with community groups and even with some of the legal services organizations is really important because sometimes you do feel like you're being targeted, and, and it, it's difficult, it's hard. If I could just okay, say so something about that. I think, I think part of the, the problem. I think part of the problem is that uh, 
physicians haven't been trained specifically to, to do that. And of course, Dr. Reichert's manual is you know essential for that. But also, I mean, there are good physicians that would that would be friends um, if they would ask farm workers if they're farm workers to start out with and you know what is going on in the course of their day. Now I also understand that there's some administrations that you know may not encourage that. Yeah, but they're. That's how they recommend. Yeah, but there are some doctors that can help. I think that are, that don't face the type of restrictions that maybe the doctors that you had experience with. There's not, the Farm Worker Association also has a physicians training um, and that they've gone around the state um, and offered to different physicians groups and healthcare provider groups. Um, if you and, and want to get in touch with them. On the sour no. I mean, we are making some partnerships with some of the medical schools before they kind of get out there. And Very do important. A lot. We're doing medical, you know, um, farm worker partnerships, especially there's a college in Immokalee, and so we're trying to have some of the students do an alternative spring break, come together. We handle the employment side of things for the most part, but then the medical students will identify some of the issues that are related to pesticides. So, you know, there, there is hope. It's just <laughs> frustrating sometimes. Absolutely. So I, I sympathize with what you say um, because, for example, and it, it varies by state. You know, some states we get good reports uh, about illnesses among farm workers. For example, Washington State, where that episode that I described took place. California, we get good data from California. But in Florida, um, for example, I looked at the last four years of data that we have, which only goes up to 2011, and I think things have gotten better since 2011, mm -hmm. that we've gotten more reports. But over the four-year period, 2008 through 2011, we only had 10 farm worker poisonings for the whole four years. So we're like scratching reported. our heads, yeah, yeah reported to us. Yeah, exactly. So we're wondering, why, why are the reports so low? And there are some warriors in the state agencies who just, we wouldn't have known about those before. <laughs> Well, I mean, I've asked, and they say, well, part of it is, you know, physicians are fearful of reporting, you know, they fear um, retaliation from their employers or from growers. Um, the farm workers are fearful of reporting. They're feared, fear of retaliation. They could lose their jobs. Um, so, yeah, there seems like there's a more fear here in the South. You know, we see similar few reports in Texas. Um, Whereas in, in California and Washington State, there's more, it seems like the farm workers have more protections. They're, they're allowed to form uh, labor unions in those states. They have the cholinesterase testing. So there's, there seems like there's a lot more um, oversight of the farm workers in, in, on the West Coast compared to in the South. Prakash, he's with the health department. He could. Uh, I'm with the Department of Health, and uh, most of our program works on acute pesticide related illness and injuries. Uh, so once we receive a report of farm workers being poisoned at farm, uh, we work with our local health department because they are the local people and they are in charge of uh, health in the county. So we work with them. Gracias. 
So I'm sort of hearing that there's a, it's a systems problem. And since I'm a physician, I'm not, don't think we should take all the blame. Uh, I, I think it is true that a lot of physicians aren't very well educated, but there are uh, sources of information and certainly CDC um, will respond if a physician contacts directly. I've done it. Um, for pediatrics, uh, there are the so-called pay shoes. You familiar? Uh, they're the pediatric environmental health specialty units that have a lot of expertise in all sorts of toxics and can hook people into, for at least for children, into experts that know about whatever the problem is. So there are sources, but it sounds like for Florida, it's breaking down. There's not enough connection between the different sources, uh, including the physicians and y'all and CDC and the health departments. So um, it seems like there's a need for <laughs> some teamwork. Uh, and I, don't, I can't answer that, solve that. Uh, but one of the reasons we get together like this is we get people from all different aspects in the same room who can get to know each other better and maybe improve the system. Yes, sir. I have a simple pair of practical question, I think. Um, since it's not going to be fixed automatically, since we don't really have the resources, since hospital systems and medical systems are not quite appropriate, since the UP is not the thing we'd like it to be yet, let me ask you a practical question. When someone's exposed in the field, whether it be by blow by or literally they're sprayed, what? Oh, are, are many of these chemicals water soluble? Will water, does it require soap? Are they oil based? Is, what's the efficacy to remove a surface contamination? <laughs> Not good, huh? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> Since, since since I wrote the book on diagnosis and match, <laughs> um, you know that's that's why, particularly for applicators, they have all these standards of what you need to do to protect yourself. The problem is for farm workers and others, they're not protected, and particularly um, absorbable materials. The worst thing are leather shoes and belts because they absorb the materials you might as well throw them away you'll never get it out um, if, if i may follow up are we typically dependent on the manufacturer for application issues or related exposure issues slash level uh, levels and in other words the fact that we know that x amount of exposure is going to be a problem we're ultimately dependent on the manufacturer's data rather than independently derived data to know that, you know, a five minute exposure to so much dusting or exposure to X herbicide is going to be a problem. We are, by and large, dependent on manufacturer information, correct? Yes. Oh, well, yeah, it's. Thank you. you. You asked a simple question that has a complex. A response, which is um, the um, goes it goes all all the way back to EPA's risk assessment paradigm, which says if you apply at X rate, you're going to be below their tolerance. Da 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 da. Um, I would sort of um, I would direct you to one of the better non-EPA documents, which was published um, over 20 years ago now, which is called Pesticides in the Diets of Infants and Children. And it was the National Academy of Sciences and went in great detail about how children were exposed, the various routes of exposure, the expected absorption based on all sorts of calculations about diet, incredibly complex, a book this thick, trying to figure out 
uh, what pesticides exposure just for children, um, right. and, and they're even perhaps more complex than adults, but um, the, the ability to estimate exposure, um, <coughs> I'll even go back one step more. Before that, uh, I had a lot of discussions about, um, with EPA, about misuse of chloridane in South Carolina, which is where I'm from. And, and the long and the short of it is chloridane, which is a persistent organic pollutant and toxic in lots of ways, was being routinely misapplied for termite control in South Carolina uh, instead of what they were supposed to do, which is trench and bury or make holes in the structure and seal them up. Uh, routinely, the pesticides were being, or uh, the chloridane was being sprayed all around the house, under the house, up in the rafters, so on and so forth, and huge levels of contamination. And when you, <clears throat> when you, when you um, said, well, maybe we should get rid of chloridane because it's being misapplied, response from EPA to me at that time was, well, we can't regulate misapplication. We can only regulate proper application. <laughs> uh, so we don't need to do anything about it because those people are doing wrong, but we, we're not going to do anything about finding out who's doing it wrong and what the results are. So the question you ask is so complex that almost unanswerable. And, and it, someone yesterday said, well, we wouldn't have to worry about all those complexities if we didn't use the pesticides in the first place. And that was my argument with chloridane and has continued since. I'm sorry. Who, who else has? <laughs> yes, I just ma wanted to make one comment. Yes. Um, so, you know, all pesticide products have a label. <clears throat> and the labels, you, the, I guess it could be argued that if you follow the label, <clears throat> you shouldn't get exposed, you shouldn't get any health effects from using that pesticide. So you shouldn't be getting the pesticide on your skin um, if you're following the label, using all the personal protective equipment that are that's dictated on the label. In real life, people do what people do. Right. Yeah. They don't. You read the label. Then you know there's still you know we still document cases where people completely follow the label the label to the letter and still get sick. But those are you know more the exception than the rule. Most of the time, we're finding that people. For the, the label wasn't followed. There was a drift, like we describe here. Where there wasn't notification. People are going into the fields too early, um, or they're not using the right personal protective equipment. Sometimes there's equipment failure, hose breaks, they get splashed. Um, so. Thank you. But that's for applicators that have access to the labels. And what we know about workers is they don't have access to the labels and they're, you know, they're not handling the pesticides in, all, in most cases, but, you know, they're still dealing with the exposures. I, I, I've got to tell one other story and I'll get to it. Uh, thing that we used to see back in the 70s is that when there was a whole lot of chlorpyrifos and diazmon being sprayed around houses for roaches is, uh, I not infrequently would have situations where the homeowner, wife, whoever, would say, oh, I don't want to clean out my cabinet so you could spray the diazinon or chlorpyrifos for the roaches in my cabinets. Will you leave me some? And uh, I think like, both, like I'm sorry. I think most of you are familiar that when you take <coughs> Uh, the concentrate of these, which are in a hydrocarbon vehicle, and you dilute it in water for spraying, it looks sort of milky. Uh, and so they would leave a little container of this milky-looking liquid, and not infrequently we'd have a child that would pick up this little container of milky liquid and take a drink of it. It's milk. It looks good. And we had severe poisoning. so. You know, misapplication, stupidity uh, is a problem if we didn't, and it's good that we don't use 
these in the house anymore because we're somewhat protected. But uh, so not having them, I think, is better than anything. Yes, ma'am. Having you, and the, and the Florida Department of Health has made great strides in this area, but for a long time did not have Spanish-speaking um, investigators to go in the field to talk to people. I, applicators, I'm not as familiar with how you would get them to report it because, you know, they do have access to the information. They're required by law to. Now, whether they really do or not, I don't know. But workers don't even have that information. Um, typically, even though they're supposed to. So it's, a, it's difficult, I think, to put the burden on the workers to report when there's so many constraints on them, not the least being they'll, they'll lose their job. Um, so how do you work with that? That's a, you know, that's a cultural, social problem you know, that you have to deal with. And I know that the Florida Department of Health has also allowed, in the past, anonymous reports and, and third-party reports as yeah, well. Yeah. So that helps. Dr. Calvert mentioned 
mentioned that California is robust in, in um, reporting pesti pesticide poisoning, but Dave and I went out a year ago and met with former farm workers and current farm workers, and pesticide poisonings are still happening in the Golden State of California, too. And it's because the, the agricultural, the county agricultural commissioners are in charge of enforcement, and some are good, and some <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I don't want to dominate, the, <laughs> but I'm not afraid to, <laughs> to talk. Um, I think that I think that by revising the worker protection standard is a good step, even though it doesn't necessarily give either side everything they want. But what it does is it pushes you know, that standard. And so the next time it's revised, you know, we can push from, from that level onto a, a, another more protective level. And you're right, that enforcement is the problem. And it's been a big problem in Florida, partly because of who's enforcing it in Florida. Um, but, and, and again, just the fact that there's no consistency across states. So I don't think it's a matter of constantly coming up with new regulations in most cases maybe in California because they have more protective regulation, but in most states you're right, it is, they need to be better enforced, more consistently enforced, and the enforcers need to follow through with the fines that they implement in the rare cases that they do find um, that somebody's in violation and imposes a fines. In Florida, they tend to drop those fines a lot. So that doesn't, you know, that, that's nothing for an employer or a grower if they know they can get out of the fine. I think that's all I'll say. Quick follow up question for the researchers on the panel. Um, I applaud both of you for uh, being here, but the current state of research in academia, I think, and I feel like seeing Big Chem, Big Ag give a lot of money to, to university systems. <laughs> I, I think that some of them get worse. Uh, I think that, you know, we're you know the reason, one of the reasons that I got involved with the Bardis initially is as a young scientist at the time, this was 1998, we were really being encouraged to um, diversify our portfolio, if you will. That, that it used to, there, there was a time with my professor, for example, where the National Science Foundation funded careers. You got one grant after another, after another, after another. And that, that time is gone, and uh, funding is getting increasingly more difficult to get, and so that there's going to be that incentive the same way that I had it. In addition, I think there's also more incentives by universities to attract big money to the university. I know that's the case on my campus for some of the same reasons. You know, we're a state-funded university that basically operates at a private school in a private school way, trying to build endowments like the endowments that places like Harvard and Yale and Stanford have, and um, I think it makes us even more vulnerable than than you know a private school that already knows how to attract that kind of money and manage that kind of money a little bit better. So no, I don't think there's anything we can do about it, and I I think we're going to see it even more. I mean, even more and more um, on my campus, faculty are being encouraged to monetize everything, including our courses. I mean, we're at a stage where we are employer employees and students are customers. And so in terms of the state of science, and uh, there's a lot of encouragement of these um, biotechnology partnerships where intellectual property flows between private and many professors actually, once they are onto a discovery, then start private companies and get involved, even if they don't start out that way. So I think it's, it's a reality of the future. It's not going to get better. It's going to get depends on your perspective. My perspective is worse, but it depends on who perspective you're looking at. It's only going to increase. And I think that part of the problem is, um, well, let's say the federal government, where the attitudes of the party in charge, even the president in charge, vastly influence how much money is given to scientific research. 
Uh, and what we've seen recently is it goes down, 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 down. So that now for what, every grant submitted, maybe one in, what, 100 is funded? Yeah, that sounds like a pretty high number. Actually. It used to be one in five. Yeah, so why even submit when you know that you're more than likely going to be turned down? So I think in... It, Let's put some pressure on the governments. <laughs> in, you know, in academia, I think there's three sources of funding. You could either get it from the government through, like, the NIH or CDC. <clears throat> you can get it from foundations, uh, like nonprofit foundations, or you can get it from, like, these corporations. But in government, the funding for research, I think, if anything, over the last five or ten years has decreased. So that's not going to be a growing source of funding. I'm not sure about the foundations. I don't know if they're... they're they're well, granting more funds. Foundations are just being hit by more and more people. Yeah. Uh, and the, but the corporations, mm -hmm. they have, you know, they, they're making record mm -hmm. profits. Yeah. They've got a lot of huge resource bud or um, research budgets. And I think, you know, if you're in academia mm -hmm. and you want to maintain your job and you want to get tenure, you've got to find fun funding from somewhere. I, I should point out beyond pesticides and series foundation and the Risla Foundation and a few others saved me. I'd be dead in the water if it wasn't for foundation money. But also, to give you an idea of, of more conflict, the university <coughs> actually really doesn't like that money because the university doesn't get their cut. So, so in terms of, so what happens, is, that's, that's the honest truth. So what happens is, of those faculty members, for example, that aren't bringing in corporate money or that aren't bringing in federal money. So if I get a federal grant, for example, the university gets, I think, 52% overhead. Whereas if I bring in, like, from Beyond, Beyond Pesticides or a series foundation or, or some other foundation, in the letter they say that the university gets a, you know, a small fee for handling the money, and, the, and that's it. And so it, when you have people who are bringing in that type of money, it actually is damaging to your tenure process. When I first started as a faculty member, when we would sit around the table, the very first question they'd ask when someone's coming up for tenure is, how many peer-reviewed publications? What is the cita citation index? The very first question asked now is, how much overhead generating funds do they bring in? With that, I, I, I'm not, the very first question. Not how many, how much funds, how much overhead generating funds. So that's either corporate funds where the university is getting a big cut or federal grants where the university gets a big cut. It really works against you to have uh, foundation money. Let me well, I got tenure, so I ain't worried about that, but I'm just <laughs> saying how it is. Let, let me emphasize what, what he just said, which is, um, your federally negotiated overhead rate, or indirect costs is what they call it, for every dollar you get to do your research, typ typically at most universities, somewhere between 50 and 70 cents has to go for overhead. Mm -hmm. so, some place, we have some institutes on campus where it's 100% overhead. So, so you have to raise twice as much as you need. So if you need, need $100,000 to do the job, the grant has to be for two hundred thousand or one hundred and seventy thousand, uh, and it's it, it really is burdensome, um, particularly when uh, an RFP comes out and says total costs for these grants will be, and then you look at it and there's not enough in it after the overhead rate for you to do the work. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> <laughs> it, it depends on how the contract's set up. In my case, my wife tells me not to use the word money laundering, but in my case, the, the money was laundering. In, in many of these cases, and by that I mean they were Novartis at the time. Novartis actually never paid me. Novartis played a company called EcoRisk. The company called EcoRisk had me on a panel, and they paid a company called Sokoki, which was basically a bank account. And then I brought the money and had a contract on the campus. So even though the industry had a confidentiality contract that ended with me, I didn't have such a contract on the campus. So I would have been liable had I leaked negative data or data they thought were negative or published data that they thought were negative without their permission. So being on a, on a public campus, we can't 
have a confidentiality contract because there's a you know we're we're it's public record. Um, but I had a, I was naive, and that's how I was told to set it up, and that really made me sort of liable, which probably wasn't a mistake. That's, they probably told me to do things that way on purpose so that, so that I was caught. But in other cases, in other universities, you can't have confidentiality contracts, or um, some cases the industry will have clauses in their contracts that says you can't publish without them, or sometimes I think it's called right of first refusal or something. They can say, um, we don't want to publish it that way, or we don't want the intellectual property. But there's always, you know, it's a, they're a business, so it's always written more to their benefit, so that there's not those kinds of risks. Yes, I have a question about um, data collection and sampling. Um, you know, so, 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 I, if I can summarize, I think the question is basically asking is, do we know enough about exposure and retention time in the body and how that relates to disease? And the answer is. And investigation, and the answer is, I don't think so. No, I mean, in the case of atrazine, I know when I do my experiments what I put in the water to get the effects that I get, so I know those levels. People who do rat studies, they know what they put in the water or what they put into the rat, but nobody knows what the what the body burdens are, how much comes out in the urine, et cetera. What we know in people for atrazine is how much comes out in their urine. So there's no way that, that I know of that you can translate a biological, a biological effect on a fish or an amphibian with this much in the water translates to this much coming out of the urine. And we also know, don't know with a one-time exposure, <coughs> like I would argue, for example, with atrazine, for a one-time exposure that you can measure, I don't think you have anything to worry about. But for a factory worker or a farm worker who's exposed repeatedly, or for a fetus who's re exposed repeatedly in the amniotic fluid, I, I don't know that way. And, and I think Lou Gillette already said it. You, people aren't big mice. I mean, it, it, you can't just scale up to a human and say, okay, there's an effect in a rodent and scale up. And Syngenta does that a lot. They argue, oh, you know how much it takes to harm a rat. And, it, and it's actually the opposite scale. Small things have a much higher metabolism. So high concentrations or high amount in a small thing doesn't mean that you scale up to a human. It's actually going to take a lot less because of our metabolic differences. I mean, there's a famous story of, um, for some reason, oh, I forget, it was years ago, uh, an experiment where they scaled up the amount of LSD that a human would take and gave it to an elephant, and the elephant went crazy. And it's because you don't just scale up for size, it's actually just the opposite. So I don't think there are any good models that I know of where you can actually make those kinds of translations, if you will. There, there, there is some data, largely population, CDC specifically um, uses uh, samples from the NHANE studies and publishes what's happening with various chemicals on a periodic basis. Um, for the individual, it's very difficult. Um, I once published a paper on the biokinetics of chloridane in one human <laughs> who had drunk a bunch of chloridane and we were able to follow his blood levels, his urine level, and we got some tissue from his fat and liver. So for a few individual chemicals, we can, um, particularly ones that are persistent, like the halogenated hydrocarbons like chlordane, do persist in fat and fatty tissues such as the liver and brain. But there's very few cases where we have enough data on the kinetics of the chemicals in humans to make any good predictions? Sort of the basic answer to your question. And, and let me clarify, I think for acute toxicity, we have a better, I'm talking about sort of long-term, low-dose exposures that lead to things like reproductive cancers and infertility and things like that. But probably for acute, yeah. you know, will it make you vomit? Will it damage your liver? Will it kill you? Those kinds of things, like those kinds of data I think we have. But not for the kinds of um, uh, uh, concerns that I study. That's probably part of it. I, guess I, yeah. can't speak to. I suspect sometimes it's the other way around. If 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 I have someone exposed to something that I'm pretty sure isn't going to be persistent in the blood mm -hmm. and isn't going to appear in the urine, and I do the sample, and someone's asking me to show that that person is damaged by that chemical, and I know I'm going to get a negative result. 
then someone's going to say to me, well, you didn't find any of them. It couldn't be that chemical that did it. So, so, so sometimes it's the other way around. You're afraid you'll get a negative result, and people will use that as evidence to disprove the exposure. <laughs> Also, I think you have to think of cost on some of these tests. Yeah. Blood analysis is quite expensive. And when you're dealing with a, a population in a lower income group, it will hit them hard. <laughs> Can you speak up? We can't. I, I have lived 25 years in Strawberry Farm community, and um, <coughs> this last two years we were exposed. And so I've been doing research, and I've talked to every agency, the EPA, and the Florida Department of Health. The Florida Department of Agriculture had a chemical company in my house at least seven times. They evacuated us the first year because I was extremely exposed. But besides that, there, when you talk about the human equivalency compulsion, comparison to, you know, I'm looking at all the research and they're saying, well, your equivalency to a rat, and then they tell you what the allowable levels are in the field for this um, chemical, it's a fumigant, and that it was in my house, they, they radar, the little thing showed in my house that it was in my home, and we were living there, and our, we have a business there, so I'm there all the time. How can they say, I know the EPA, determines the level at the exposure which you consider not severely injured or um, that your, your exposure. But how can they determine that when you just told me that a rat, when they do it in the lab, that they're giving them higher concentrations than I can handle? Um, like the concentrations of uh, dimethyl disulfate, they said that it can be 55 parts per billion in the field and that it's acceptable for us uh, there are allowable amounts in Kelsborough County states that um, as long as it's below that, um, then you should not be sick. But um, I want to know from the legal standpoint, um, the EPA told me that in 2011 that they have no control over the farmers in the field, that they don't even go to the fields because of the fact that we have no jurisdiction. And I can even tell you the gentleman that told me that, and I have emails to prove it. And then the Florida Department of Agriculture tells me that if it is applied correctly, that is our sole responsibility. And the Department of Health tells me that we can do the research and we know that you're sick, but we can't influence them. So, number one, Joan, I want to ask you what can we do on, um, from a legal standpoint to motivate these people? I have research. I did the research myself. I'm not a scientist. I went door to door as much as I could. We had a community meeting with um, the EPA, the Florida Department of Agriculture. I spent probably, well, I spent the last two years trying to get this out in the open. How do I get them? I just got a report back from the EPA. Well, Ms. Zankovich, it was applied correctly. There's nothing all we can do. The end. Well, there was one person that died, and there are multiple people that have never gotten well. I've had bronchitis six times this year. And it has so many My son, the first week they exposed, he was throwing up and nosebleed all at the same time. He's 21, never had this before. That just people were falling over, standing, waiting for the bus because of the exposure. It is so pervasive. I have given every agency these hundreds of families that I was able to go to, and there's nothing I can do. I need to know why, number one, why the research states that we can handle this high level. Number two, what can we do? to change this in our community. And everyone in the agencies are afraid to say anything. Well, Ms. Sankovic, we really care about you and we're concerned, but there's nothing we can do. We're afraid of our jobs. You told me this. And there's like, Ms. Sankovic, you keep doing what you can. You're making a difference. I said, but it's not my job. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. I am not the legal department. I am not the EPA. I need to know, and, and this is not just my chemical. I talk to statewide. These are issues, not with just one chemical, but what can we do in the state of Florida to make a difference? And the news, don't forget the news people, there were two news reporters that were threatened with their jobs and told to drop the story. Directly told to me from them. What newspaper was that? I'm not allowed, I'm going to leave that one.
story and I commend you for taking a stand that you did you, and that's the way that things get done I mean I know it's not it shouldn't be your burden but if you look at these at these stories across the country it's exactly the way that anything gets done is doing exactly what you've been doing um, I don't think that the solution is to look <coughs> to the legal system because of the things that you already know you know, the, if people are following the law, um, and then there's no liability really there. So that's not usually the most effective method. And there's other reasons why a lawsuit wouldn't remedy um, the problem. Lawsuits are long, they're expensive. Um, in the end, you get money. I mean, basically, sometimes you can get corrective agents. Agent, you know, sometimes you can get corrective action. <coughs> Um, but it, it's it's not always the solution, um, I and I want to save our world. yeah, I mean, and a lawsuit sometimes won't do that for you. Um, the use of the media is really important in those situations, but I mean, finding brave reporters. I mean, I think it's I think it's unusual that reporters are intimidated like that. Um, there must be other reporters out there that that aren't. <laughs> so, so, they are. And really, the media ones. can be such an important tool in those in those cases. Not when the agricultural controls them. So, I, don't I don't think they control all the media, but yeah, I'd like I'd like to make. Um, Just one, two little <coughs> two comments on that. One is uh, beyond pesticides and other groups have come out in strong opposition to the use of fumigants in strawberries. I mean, that's something that's going on uh, because there, we believe that the risk assessments by EPA on fumigants and strawberries are not properly done or properly concluded. Um, the second um, uh, is that, in general, uh, there are real defects in this risk assessment process that EPA uses to set tolerances and decide how things can be applied. This is what you're talking about. And beyond pesticides and a lot of other groups uh, continually try, A, to get improvement in those processes at EPA. Maybe you can speak to it. <laughs> um, but also, you know, the idea that if we, if we go to organic systems, if you go organic strawberries, which can be done, uh, 
there are no fumigants, there are no pesticides used, and that's protective. So, so I think that this is a situation where, yes, what's being done is wrong. Yes, there are organizations that are working to correct it across the country. Uh, and yes, my experience in, in and around Florida, and it's one of the reasons we're here, is things don't go well in Florida even compared to some other states like California. Um, I mean, Florida is a real, I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> it is a pesticide wasteland. <laughs> well, you know, the, the climate in Florida, as long as I've been working in this area, which is a while, has been terrible. And that's one of the reasons we're here today. Anyone else have any comments on that? Yes, ma'am. I was born and raised in a popular, I worked on the farm. We was on the farm when they played, sprayed DDT. They were spread over the head of us when we were in the field and right next to the next field. So we constantly got it. Even most of the people around where I live at have orange trees. They would spray our homes. We could be washing, hanging up clothes, and we have to hang up clothes, and they just come over the head and just spray us. So not only we was exposed in the field, we were exposed in our own yard too. We had a lot of women having stillborn babies. They was on little respirators and different stuff, so we've been at asthma, you name it, we got all kind of stuff going on in my community. High case of lupus, cancer, eye problem you can't hardly see, and arthritis real bad. Cancer, and my daughter was born with our right hand. We're fighting a lot of stuff, and we've been doing this for 17 years. Yes, ma'am. And still fighting. And still fighting. I refuse. You know what? My grandfather told me to give up, but never give up. That's why I'm here. Yes, ma'am. Because I'm standing for my community, which is fate, not fate. You talking about that? At one time, we were marrying 13 or 14 people a week. And there's been numerous law firms that have visited the Lake Apopka workers, and none of them have ever followed up with a lawsuit. None. <laughs> yeah. I was told that there was not enough proof. That's what they say. Because of the different chemicals that they sprayed, <coughs> they could have stayed in one of those. And then a lot of people that stay in my area, they would migrate. We walked through migrators. We didn't go nowhere. We stayed right behind. We were sick. People come in, they, they were sick too. So they say, oh, well, you can't prove it, break it down to that. It's just one chemical. It could be many of them. Well, they sprayed not only the orange grove, they sprayed the nursery, and they sprayed the farm. So you, we got different chemicals in different areas. But then we're told, put filters on your, on your well, put filters all in through the house. I have filters on everything. And then I pull, I pull out this list of the filter that says, here's all the chemicals that it's filtering out of my water. <laughs> it's a list this long. <laughs> and I bought it at Walmart. I mean, come on people, if you know it's in the water and we're having to purify it because it's in our water, don't you think it's in our bodies? Don't you think it's going into, I mean, how many years have you been doing this? 33 years annual, I mean, come on. How long does it take to figure it out, to put two and two together and make four? But my grandfather and I've been working on the farm ever since the 40s. So, Just so think of how much of chemicals they received, and then they passed it on to us. So, so a, lot of, a lot of what we're hearing is discouraging and depressing, but I think, I think we really need to realize that the, the, the passion in this room to improve things is here. And, and hopefully one of, the, one of the good things that'll come out of this conference is, is not only that the passion can be supported, but that we can establish some connections to help things work a little better. I mean, that's, 
That's why we're having the meeting here. Thank you. So, Thank you all. Uh, we, we need to get lunch and be back in here at quarter past one.